If you don't know Chris, he's the man behind uh, Overwater Bases and he's a super fantastic base builder, Luthier, and uh, he's a, like, in terms of knowledge of the instrument, you can, if you've got any questions about, you know, base maintenance or base building or wood quality or do, does wood actually make a difference or active versus passive and all them things, you're not going to come across a cooler guy to actually ask that stuff too. But before we go on any further, I also want to just give Chris a shout out because if it actually wasn't for Chris May, Scott's bass lessons wouldn't even exist because I started working for Chris when I was 16 years old and up until that point I was a bit of a lost teenager, didn't really know what to do in my life. Bullied Chris into giving me an apprenticeship work in his workshop and I played a bit of guitar and then through uh, Chris re-educating me in terms of like music, you know, I discovered the bass and also discovered that you can, you know, create a great, uh, you can do great things in, in your life uh, if you just put the work in and Chris was a great role model for me because it's the first time I met a guy that had actually created this, you know, he was an entrepreneurial type guy and he's making bases and before I met Chris I was off to work in a biscuit factory. True story. And, and and luckily I met Chris and then, you know, and long story short, he got me into bass and really gave me the confidence to be a player and, and go and do this whole thing. So if it wasn't for Chris, none of this would exist at all, like seriously. So thank you, Chris, for being such an amazing guy. Oh, Chris. Okay, um, what I'm going to do with this, I've been doing um, some, some um, sessions in a smaller room at the other end of the, of the show, um, in the Luthiers room, where I've been dealing with some very specific um, issues. I, there I was, I was talking very much about um, where tone comes from and uh, about signal quality, which is very important, obviously, within, it, it's about getting what you're doing out there in, in the, the, purest, um, the purest way. So, <clears throat> but in this session, we, we, we can touch on all that stuff, but what I would like to do is make it more interactive. I would like you guys to, to um, become part of it, and I would like to do more of a sort of question and answer thing. So if you've got any, any um, thoughts about it, or any ideas, or any, any, any questions, then you know, put your hand up or give us a shout and we'll, we'll go through it. Um, but what I thought I'd do to start with is, is actually talk about the instrument itself. Now, I mean, obviously, it's, it's the bass guitar, I mean, there's been basses around, as in double basses, for a long time. But in terms of the bass guitar, it's, it, there's an instrument, it's about the same vintage as me, as I was saying earlier. So, um, so it was kind of created in the early 50s. And the, obviously, for most of us, Leo Fender is where it all came from. But one of the things that we have to remember, and this is something I've been saying in, in the other sessions, is that um, Leo wasn't a luthier, he wasn't a guitar maker in the normal sense of the word. He was, he was a, 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 an entrepreneur, he was a, um, a production engineer, he had a background in electronics, but he saw a need. Um, for a transportable bass instrument that could be played by guitarists and, and frets and things like that. Didn't it? So, um, you know, and the bass was born. But it, a lot of the things that, that um, um, came about within the instrument um, when, when, uh, we've become uh, the, the part of the canon, if you like, you know, we, we accept it as, as, as standard stuff, is not. Um, there for, for lutery reasons, you know, they're, they're there for economic reasons and, and technical reasons and um, um, production reasons. So, I mean, to start with, I'm just going to pick up this guitar here. You thought I wasn't going to get away with having somebody with a guitar in their life. Um, this, this is an instrument, actually, it's based on Scott's little jazz bass that we made for him when he was, um, uh, I'm not allowed to say jazz bass, am I? J-series. Um, 
that we made for him when he started doing the videos and wanted a full screen to work with. Um, but it's essentially built in the same way that a, that a, um, a fender base is, in that you know it's a one piece ash body, small patch body, uh, a one piece maple neck. Um, it's got a straight head stock. It's got um, jazz bass pickups, the electronics are modular, um, and the scratch plate and all the rest of it. So it's it's built. It's got narrower string spacing and shorter scale length and all the rest of it. But it's essentially it's a jazz bass. Um, and when Leo originally um, designed the instrument, only part of what he was doing was making a musical instrument. What he was also designing was a production technique. So it's it's very modular. You know, it's he was the as I've been saying, he's, he was the Henry Ford um, of the guitar making world, um, and this is <coughs> obviously true with guitars as well as, as the basses. So a lot of the stuff that goes on within this, and the stuff that we've become accepting as being part of the instrument, actually um, are there for reasons that aren't necessarily those that you might initially think. So I mean, just simple things like the fact that the headstock's in, in a straight line, you know, there's no angle. I mean, these bases here all have an angle on the headstock, whereas this one is, is straight. And the only reason they did that was because it meant he could make the whole neck out of one, one inch piece of timber. Um, he didn't have to have all that waste off the back of the neck or graft in stocks on or anything like that. Um, but he did have to invent a string retainer um, because the, the whole point of having an angled headstock, of course, is that, that you can have a, um, um, the right angle of, of, of string tension over, over the nut. Um, and also the fact that the electronics, um, well, I'm going to put the guitar down now. The fact that the electronics um, were modular, so they were pre-wired, they came on a plate. Um, the plate was metal, so it had some shielding um, attributes, um, only in one direction, but it did have some shielding, and it allowed you to, to I mean, they didn't even put a, a connecting wire between the pots, they just relied on the, on the metal on the, um, uh, on the plate to, to do that, which is great until the pot becomes loose. Um, but, um, so, you know, the, as I say, a lot of the, the, the technology that went into it was, was about um, um, making something that was easier to make in a, in a factory environment using semi-skilled labour. You know, that's the materials that they chose, um, things like maple and alder and, and ash, again, were chosen largely for their engineering qualities and their availability and the fact that it was easy to machine. I mean, maple is very good for necks because you don't have to cut it on the quarter, which means you know the, 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 the grain in it isn't, isn't that important. It's still as strong cut flat as it is you know, cut with the grain running through the middle, which you would normally have to do if you were using the traditional luthery woods like mahogany and those sort of things. Um, so it was, a, it was a sensible choice. Um, in terms of its tonal quality, it is brighter. It, it, it rings more because it's harder wood. Um, it, it's, it's got longer fibres with it, so, and that affects the tone of it. Um, the, um, but as I say, that from a manufacturing point of view, I'm pretty certain that it had nothing to do with why um, it was chosen. In the same way as when he chose woods, like the initial guitars were made out of alder and then ash, was because it was available. It was indigenous. It was, it was used in, in North America in the furniture industry and in the building trade for, for, uh, and all that sort of thing. So uh, he could buy it relatively easily and he, he could be selected with it. Um, and it, it, it machined well. It came in big bits um, and it wasn't too expensive. So, you know, I, I know it bursts a few bubbles in the, in the sort of vintage world. Um, but having said all that, he got a lot of stuff right, you know, things like scale lengths and string spacing and pickups and all this sort of stuff. We still, we still do. And our ears, and because it was first, or nearly first, I mean there were people making bass guitars before, but not in a commercial sense. Because he was first, he was producing something that was, um, that our ears became attuned to. So, you know, we think of the classic jazz bass, the classic precision and all the rest of it. When the next generation came along, after Leo, I mean, as I say, Leo, I met him when he was an old man, and he really didn't like rock and roll. He thought he kind of went wrong with Buddy Holly. Um, 
Uh, and <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, obviously you made a lot of money. Right? Um, but um, when the next generation came along, we started to examine why. I say we. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not quite the next generation. I would say the next generation after Leo Fender. I mean, obviously people like Fender, uh, Rick and Becker and, and, and Gibson and people made bases in the 50s, um, but not to the extent that Fender. I mean, Fender became the generic name for bass. You know, it's like Hoop or Biro or whatever. Um, but in, in, the, in the next generations, when you get through to the late 60s, you get Rick Turner appears with, with Alembic. And we then start to get the multi-laminate, we start to get the fancy, fancy woods, we start to get a, 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 um, active electronics, we start to get more sophisticated pickup um, construction and you know, people looking at hardware and how it affects the tonality of the instrument, you know, start using brass, for instance, for bridges. And, um, and that really is the beginning of the instrument. You know, the two, the two people that repre are represented here are Rick Turner and Leo Fender. And <clears throat> the next generation, which is really my generation, that came along in the late 70s and early 80s, who are still a lot of them still active and, and are sort of top of their game. You know, people like Roger Sadowski and Vinny Federa and Ken Smith, although Ken was a player really rather than a maker, and Stuart Spector, and, and in this country, of course, dear old Walt and, and Pete the Fish who were very much my big brothers. Um, and um, we came along at a time when bass came out of the shadows, really, you know. Um, it wasn't that, you know, some rumble that went on in the corner. It, it started to get players, you know, Stanley Clark had come along, along Jacko had come along. And, and that's what Scott was talking about. You know, we, we were in the workshop listening to these people. Um, and it, you start to see, you know, the possibilities of, of, of that instrument. And as the players were developing, then we as makers were developing. And we were really about solving problems. You know, I mean, Alembic had gotten involved in, in Active Electronics. I mean, actually, Active, Active, Active Electronics Guild made a, an onboard preamp in the 1950s using hair, hearing aid valves, um, but they weren't terribly efficient. And, you know, the whole battery situation was difficult, you know, but the, 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 I mean, the early Olympics had external power supplies, you know, they, they you know, run a cable in as well as a cable out. Um, but as technology moved along and, and, and um, the art of the player moved along, then the art of the builder could move along with it or and sometimes let it, and sometimes, you know, but it was usually, I think all the good stuff has come from players. You know, the reason why suddenly five-string basses appeared in, in, the, in the early 1980s um, was because of keyboards. You know, suddenly all these pop bands had got hold of synthesizers, and they were, they were all playing stuff in C. And it was going, they were going down below the, the, the north, uh, so bass players, instead of going down with the keyboard, they were going, go up. So they were saying, what's going on here? Now in our initial um, uh, response to that um, was, was we built something called a C base for a very short period, um, which was a 36 inch scale um, four string base that was tuned C, F, B flat, E flat. So you can get your head around that one. Um, but it was brought to me as a concept by a guy called Andrew Bodner, who um, was the house bass player for Stiff Records, basically. And um, he was, he, well, he went out with the Thompson twins and they said, can you um, uh, <laughs> make something that goes low enough? And, and, and they go down to C, so we made a C place. And then from that, five strings developed. And, and uh, I think ourselves and Wall were probably the first five string builders in Europe. Um, it was happening in the States. I mean, there were, there were, there were people building five strings in the States. But it happened organically, it was because of a need. In the same way, I mean, one of the things that um, I've developed or got involved in over the years is, is, is um, the whole thing that I was talking about in the, in the, uh, the other booth, which is, a, is, is about signal quality and sound and, and the stuff that, that certain environments need 
basically. I mean, if you're in a rock band and there's lots and lots of noise going on, the signal quality, obviously you need to get the volume out there, but if there's a bit of noise going on, it, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, you can cover it up with all the other noise that's going on. But if you're in a, in a studio, or if you're in a TV studio, or in a, a theatre pit, um, then that paradigm changes. You, you then have engineers on your neck um, saying, you know, why am I getting these buzzes? Where's it coming from? So, and as I say, the hum council pickup had been invented um, by, by, by people at Gibson in the 1950s. Um, and they were wrapped in, in metal covers, which was, was early attempts at shielding, which well, was very good shielding, actually. Although all, all the people in the 70s started taking the covers off, um, thinking that it was cooler and that you would get a better sound, which is complete rubbish, but there you go. Um, <laughs> And, um, you know, I mean, if you remember, Rickenbackers had those great big metal covers over the pickups, you know. But if the rest of the instrument isn't tuned properly, then, you know, you're still going to get all sorts of noise from lights and motors and, and, and dimmer switches and anything that's got pulsing or moving parts, you know, that's electrical. Plus, of course, the mains itself, which is the 50 cycle, 60 cycle hum, that humbucking or hum cancelling pickups are designed to, to alleviate. Um, so, um, in, as I say, in, in my, my world, for, a, for a, a long time I've worked with lots and lots of studio players and lots and lots particularly of pit players. I mean, most of the West End has got our bases in and some of Broadway. And a lot of the touring theatre guys. And, uh, and that's because um, that's where it is really critical. And you get noise and you just get earache, basically, because, you know, it's... it's it, and if engine and, and we're very lucky, engineers like us. So you know that's why we keep on selling bases to those people because it almost becomes a sort of um, required <laughs> piece of equipment, uh, which is nice. But it's only a small world, so I mean, it's, it doesn't it, it doesn't keep us going completely. Um, but it does lead you to do, to look at things a lot more closely. So I mean, we we've developed um, various shielding. Um, methods, you know, internal shielding with pickups, where we wrap the pickup completely in a copper gauze so that it can um, uh, keep the, the, the outside interference from coming into the pickup at source, and then shielding the inside of the, the cavities, um, remembering to ground it, of course, because it's important, it's not grounded. Um, of, so there's a 360 degree force field around the, around the components in the instrument, which again stops this outside interference. But then, of course, you get signal loss cables. You know, the idea that, that um, a, uh, a passive instrument with, with minimum components is the purest sound you can get is actually um, an assumption that's not true. Um, because what happens is that as soon as you start passing um, signal down a cable, you start to get losses um, because there's capacitance in the cable and the, the signal is degradating. If the because the, the pickup the the, the pickup um, is a relatively high impedance device and high impedance signal is much more prone to, to losses. Um, so by this is where active electronics start to come in. Is that active electronics aren't all about um, lots and lots of onboard EQ. Um, that's a byproduct. That's something that you can do with it. But essentially, active electronics just mean you've got one of these, and that means that you can do stuff that you can't do relying purely on the signal that's coming from the pickup. Because the, the amount of voltage that's coming out of the pickup, I mean, I mean, you probably know how a pickup works, but essentially it's the same as a, a, as a dynamo or a, um, anything that you know creates electricity. It's, it's, a, it's a copper coil which has a, a magnet associated with it, and you move a metal object within that which creates um, disruption of the magnetic field and causes a current to be produced. You know, it's exactly the same as a dynamo you put on the front row wheel of your bike. Um, except we turn it into sound instead of light or other forms of energy. Um, but that signal is very weak. And um, with 
passive electronics, the only thing you can do is take stuff away. So with a, with a passive tone control, it's a, it's a very crude filter that removes, using a capacitor, removes all the frequencies over a certain level, progressively using a variable resistor. Um, so you drain away top end, um, uh, fairly indiscriminately, if you seem to me. But it works and it has a very, uh, again, it's something we've got used to, you know, that rolled off tone sound is part of what we use and how we learn to create. And something that I often say is that a good analogy with the way that we've got used to what happens with, with in that sort of situation is if you look at amplifiers. If you go back to the 1950s, um, amplifiers were very prone to distortion. Um, they were all had valves in them, but I'm sure that people like, like um, again, Fender and Marshall, uh, Jim Marshall and Jennings and those guys who were building amplifiers in those days, distortion was the last thing they wanted. It was, as I say, it was an unfortunate byproduct of inferior technology. But, of course, art came along, and Hendrix again has mentioned, and various other people before that who learned to capture this distortion and make an art form out of it. And the same thing is true, you know, with the crude technology uh, in terms of the actual instrument itself, you know. Um, so, you know, rolling, rolling all that um, tone off can give you a, a, a different uh, tonality. The thing that happens with a, with a jazz bass when the pickups mix together because they're loading each other gives you an interesting palette of sounds that aren't pure but they're nevertheless, you know, they can be uh, adapted by, by the player and used. And, of course, you get used to this stuff. But what you can do, of course, you can open another whole set of windows by removing some of those things and giving yourself a little bit more headroom, as it were, in the same way as amplifiers have more headroom. So, I mean, one of the things that we, we developed in, in recent years, I, I work quite closely with a guy called John East, who I'm sure a lot of you know, um, Jay Retro is and all the rest of it, who, who essentially um, uh, builds um, replacement electronic units for um, the instruments that already exist, if you like, it's a retrofit market. But with us, he works on original um, um, control systems, if you like, um, and he, with some, some help from me and a couple of other people, came, came up with this. Um, which is our three band which we use at all. I'm losing it. Um, we use. No, oh, there you go. We, we use it a, a lot of our um, <clears throat> instruments, and that's great, um, and it, it, it allows the more control. But the fundamental thing that that circuit does, forget the three band EQ bit, is it, it lowers the impedance and it adds gain. Um, and it gives you, and it gives you a buffered sweep between the pickups, so that you know you you you've got more purity at source, and you get less losses in, in the whole thing. Yep. Um, sorry, did you want to say? No. You, yeah. Um, so thinking about that and realizing that some people don't like lots of knobs and don't, and my as time's gone on, I've become more of a kind of. Um, more is less, less is more sort of person, if you see what I mean. I, 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 don't get me wrong, I mean, I think that, that onboard EQ is very useful, but the most useful part of it is the bit that I was just describing, and particularly in the environments that I've been talking about. So something that, that we developed, which is it's here, this little, from that side, that looks very much like a standard sort of fender plate with three knobs on it, you know, and to some degree it is, that's a volume and that's a passive tone control. But what goes on in the middle is where the magic happens. And instead of being a second volume control, that's a pan. Now, I mean, lots of people use pans. And none of this is unique, it's just the way that we've adapted it. So we then attach it <clears throat> to something that you, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, essentially a DI box. But instead of being farther down the chain, it's at source. So that just, uh, and it's a buffer circuit, and it's got a little two-channel mixer in it. So it allows you to blend between the pickups individually so that one isn't loading the other. 
it allows you to lower the impedance of the signal and it allows you to lay, to add a little bit of gain at your discretion because the gain is, is presentable. So you can have it flat, um, unity gain, or you can add some, some extra volume in there. It also means you can balance the pickups, all that thing about winding pickups and up and down. You get them approximately the same distance from the strings and then you adjust the volumes internally. Um, and it's very, very simple to use, and it gives you exactly what's coming out of the base, and that's what's in there, and it's also what's in Scott's uh, P base. And what it does is, is to say it, it does not change the signal, but it doesn't sound like a vintage P base or a vintage jazz base quite. You know, it's fairly close. I mean, there are some people in this room who who, who uh, uh, are using them. Um, and it does give you it does give you more dynamics, um, but it, it it doesn't fundamentally. It actually gives you a purer purer tone. Now, an interesting upshot of that, going back to the analysing of distortion, is is um, when when I built the um, the, the P base for, for Scott, he was saying, yeah, it's great, but it doesn't. It's it's a bit too clean. Um, <laughs> So um, I got on the phone to John and said, you know, um, what can we do about this? And um, so, I mean, it's not there yet, but he's, he's, he's playing with it. And he's, he's coming about re-engineering the, uh, um, the stuff that we were trying to get rid of back into the system again, <laughs> but in a controlled fashion um, with, with, with the quality of signal so it doesn't degradate further as it goes down. The, the, through the chain. I mean, another use where this sort of stuff is very, very useful would be um, things where, and I think we're going to have some pedals next, um, um, but where you're using lots of pedals. I mean, we, we, we built it, the, some of you may know a, a bass player called Chris Hargreaves, who uses masses of pedals and synth triggering and all sorts of stuff. He plays for Vampire Submotion Orchestra. Yes, Submotion Orchestra. Motion orchestra. And, um, uh, he was using an old jazz bass, which he loved the sound of in a live situation, but there was too much rubbish going on in the system with all those pedals. So we built him a very simple, something that looks exactly like the jazz bass that he used to play. In fact, yeah. doesn't even have, even has the plate, no scratch plate. Um, but it's got one, one of these in it, and it means that he can get that really clean signal into, into his system and he's not engineering noise at source. But anyway, so um, that's a little bit about what I do. Um, has anybody got any questions? Um, we're about halfway through the session. Yeah. Uh, when you were mentioning um, the different picks, pickups loading each other, what do you mean by that? With well, because essentially, I mean, without getting too technical about it. I mean, it, it, the, the, the coils have an effect on each other because particularly in, if you separate them, you know, if you have a, just a three-way switch, then you just get one pickup or you just get the other pickup. But as soon as you start blending those pickups, then the energy from one pickup can load the energy of the other pickup, even if that pickup isn't creating as much of the sound, if you see what I mean. So it's, it's kind of like an overflow of <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, it's, okay. it's, it's um, I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, I'm not that, I mean, you need somebody more technical than me to really explain what, what's going on. But if you, if you remember how a jazz bass works, you've got two volume controls, okay. and nearly everything happens right at the end. And, Normally, with a two-volume um, guitar passive system, you have a switch. Um, and normally, if you roll one volume, if you think about the Les Paul or something, you roll one volume completely off when it's in the middle, everything goes off. Well, a jazz bass is, is wired slightly differently, so that doesn't happen. But what does happen is it sends some of the signal through the other pickup, so it changes the sound. So it's only when you've only got one pickup in. And I'm not sure, you may even have some effect even when you roll one of the pickups completely off. Uh, so if you then separate those two pickups um, by, by buffering, um, it means that, that they act independently and you get a much smoother spread from one pickup. So you can have a little bit, little bit, little bit. It's like, 
you know, paddling across the stereo, you know, with the, with the hi-fi okay. from one side to the other. Um, it also means that technically you could actually have two tone controls. Um, I mean, this, this, the tone control on here is just a standard pot, but it's a dual gang pot and there are two capacitors. Now, as it is, they're wired together, so they're working, working parallel. But you could effectively take the jack socket out, put another knob in, and take the jack socket from somewhere else, have a second tone control. So you could have one completely rolled off and one completely rolled on. That's without any, adding any active electronics. Suddenly you've got a whole load more um, available options to you in a very, very simple package. Um, and as I say, it just, and it just enables it to, to, to be, um, be pure. And, yeah. yeah, and all my quests are going to be really, really basic. But one, and my ba I've got an active, not a rules, but with, with, a, with a battery in it, and yep. it just goes without warning. I've had the base for 20 years, I've had like four or five batteries, they last a long time, but they go completely without warning. No, no, no deterioration. Yeah, generally what you find with active pre are that they will work, they're, they're designed to work at either 18 or, or 9 volts. Um, with 18 volts, you get a bit more headroom, so you get less possibility of distortion and all the rest of it. But most of them will work adequately at 9 volts. I mean, all our preamps are at 9 volt systems. Um, and they will work pretty well perfectly down to 6 volts. Once it drops below 6 volts, you start to hear, if you listen carefully, you will start to hear some degradation going on. You get a little bit of distortion, it will sound like it's not like a tune anymore, and it, it's, it's losing power. It will go on like that until it gets down below three volts. Once it gets below the point where it's a bit like the torch, you know, it, you keep it on and it gets lower and lower and lower and then it starts flickering and then eventually it goes off. And so it going suddenly off means that you completely run out of power and you should have actually changed the battery probably a month ago. I said there's no way it'll be perfect. I'll literally go to I don't know. I mean, as I say, I, I, my experience with most active preamps, I mean, I don't have a huge amount of experience with other people's preamps, but my experience generally is that um, they start to, the signal degrades before it goes off. Um, have you got a, a, um, a flip top battery compartment on the back of it? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, what I would say is, as a matter of course, change the battery every three months. Well, I mean, it costs a quid, you know, two quid. Well, you're doing really, really well. I'm surprised it <laughs> hasn't melted in there. Um, but no, I mean, I would just say change the battery more often. Um, and the only thing to remember with, with active bases, obviously everybody probably knows this, is don't leave them plugged in, because generally the, um, uh, we use a stereo jack socket in order to turn the circuit on, so it's switching through the negative side. Um, and if you leave it, leave it plugged in, then you're draining the battery even though you're not playing it. The, the yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 any any anything else anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, about pickups um, they are passive and active because is this the same uh, like uh, passive and active? Well there's two the, the, the depends on your description if you like. There are active pickups, you know, an EMG, for instance, won't work without a battery. The pickup itself won't work without a battery because it, it, it needs a, a power source. The reason why, I mean, most, most pickups, are, they create their own energy. They don't need an outside power source. They just need an outside power source in order to amplify that to audible levels. Um, but with an active pickup, it means that there's a couple of things that you, that, that you can do with it. One is that you can have less turns on the, um, on the pickup, less wire, so you have less resistance, and therefore you, you get less, um, you get a more, a, a brighter, more hi-fi output from it. So that helps to start with. The second thing is you can do what EMG do, which is put pre-EQ in there. So basically, what an EMG base active base pickup is doing is scooping the middle out, which makes it sound a lot more produced. So everything sounds a lot more high fire, a lot more produced. It doesn't necessarily help 
It might make a, 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 an average sounding instrument sound better at, on its own, but it doesn't necessarily help in, in the context of a band. I'm sure bass players will know this, that, that you know, it's, the sound that sounds great on its own isn't necessarily the sound, sound that sounds great in the band. And you need a bit of that sort of grunt at the low mid in order for it to punch through. Otherwise, you need a ton more body. You know, the old trace out, you scoop everything out in the middle, you know. It's great if you've got this much speaker, you know, speaker companies. Um, but, um, <clears throat> you know, but that's, it's, it's, as I say, that's, that's really, I mean, active pickups are just pickups that require um, an outside power source because they don't have enough energy, they don't create enough energy themselves. The other thing is people talk about active pickups, they just mean that there is an active preamp like I've been talking about in the system with a regular pickup. But what you do have to remember is as soon as you start amplifying stuff, you amplify the stuff you don't want as well as the stuff that you do want. So if you, for instance, add a preamp into a jazz bass, the noise that you're getting because they're single coil unshielded pickups will get a 10 times worse because you know, you're amplifying the noise as well as amplifying the, um, the signal. Um, something else that we developed, which again is no, by no means unique, I mean, um, Alembic used ghost coils back in the 1960s, um, certainly the 1970s. Um, <clears throat> but a ghost coil is a secondary, I mean, a, a hum cancelling pickup basically um, cancels the hum by um, it, it, it uh, how can I put it? Um, you have two coils that work um, with each other in such a way that they eliminate, they cancel the hum, but not the signal. If you see what I mean, and it's about polarity and the way that they're wound and the way that the magnets go in and all the rest of it. And you've heard about you know pickups being out of phase and they go all kind of thin, and that's when you've got it wrong. Um, and you, but you can you can take a um, the, two, the twin coil idea and take the sound generation portion of it away so that you're only using a single coil to generate the sound. So that single coil must have a magnet associated with it and the string movement. <clears throat> that will then allow you to create a signal. If you then take a second coil which is of equal resistance to the, to the, the coil that you're using to create the sound, and um, secrete that somewhere else, but connect it either in series or in parallel with the coil that you're using to generate the signal, then that will um, <clears throat> remove that 60 cycles, 50 cycles, how much source, okay? Um, but, um, if, as I say, but if, what it will do is it will retain more of a single coil sound. Now, I mean, single coil pickups, the sort of thing we're used to look, seeing that looks like a jazz bass, pick up. Sound the way they do for m several reasons. One, that they are single coil. Two, that it's a relatively narrow, relatively tall coil, which affects the way that it, it, it sounds in itself and also the way that um, it, it uh, or the amount of string that it picks up, because it's what they call the magnetic window, is the, the, the area of, 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 of force field, if you like, that's been created by the magnet. Uh, which the string can disrupt and therefore um, cause the, the, the pickup to create the signal. Um, so that's why a single coil pickup will sound a lot more focused and, and, and kind of tight than, than, a, than a wider soap bar type dual coil pickup. Um, and similarly, if you wire, a, you have a, sta a normal stack pickup, you can cause the same thing, you still have the tall coils, but you're, you're generating sound from two coils rather than one. So you start, again, you get a, a tend to get a, a warmer, fatter, slightly less hi-fi tonality of it, which can be very nice, you know, don't get me wrong. It's, it's, so therefore, what you can either do is you can either stick the coils end to end, which is essentially what a P-based pickup is. You know, you've got two coils, one for two strings and one for two strings. Um, or you can do the same thing in there. Instead of having one single coil, you can have two single coils. Um, the, the only downside of that is the P-base pickup, as you know, is overlapping, so you get a certain amount of spread. With that, it's very specific 
to polarity. If the string is a little bit off line, then one of them might not be quite as loud as the others. So, um, and because we work with lots of different string spacings, like this thing here, which is only 16.5 string spacing as opposed to a normal 90, which is a fender. Um, if you try to use, you know, a, a, one of those split coil ones, it just wouldn't work. So um, what we use is a bar pole piece. It's still a magnet because that's the other difference between a lot of soap bar pickups. A lot of soap pickups, bar pickups, use a steel pole piece, but they use a magnet underneath it, and that magnetizes the steel pole piece. But with a lot with fender type pickups, as you know, you know, you get the little slugs that stick through. And it doesn't really matter if it's eight little ones or one big one. Um, it's still creating that same magnetic field. There will be slight differences to, to, to the sound, but essentially the same thing is going on. Um, but if you, as I say, if you want to move the strings, then that doesn't work. So what we do is we put one bar magnet along the entire length in the middle of the coil, which means that we can move the strings wherever we like. Um, but what we then do is take a second coil, but we don't put a magnet in the middle of it, and we put it on the on the back of the first coil, which is you can see it's sticking out of the back of the thing. We then wrap the whole thing up in copper gauze, so you then get hum cancelling and shielding all in one hit, but retain something that's pretty damn close to a single coil pickup. Why did I start all that? <laughs> Any, any, any other, um, any other, yes? Um, do you sometimes use piezos? And would you consider it? <coughs> yes, we do sometimes use piezos. Piezos are very useful, in, obviously, in acoustic instruments. Um, you can, you, you don't, it doesn't rely on having a steel string. Um, because a, a, an electromagnetic pickup will only work if you have at least a portion of the string has to be steel. Um, so, um, with a nylon string instrument, you would have, or something like that, you would have to, you'd have to use a piezo pickup. Um, a piezo pickup works in a slightly different way. It's, it's about bending crystals, basically, so that they, they pick up the vibrations. Um, I was telling the story to um, uh, to John, who's in the back there earlier on. And one of my early, um, I don't know exactly what you call him, but I got to know him quite well. It was a, 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 a German-American guy called Bill Lawrence, um, who some of you may have come across, you may have heard of Bill Lawrence pickups. He's unfortunately long gone, I think. But he, he originally worked for Framers back in the 50s in Germany and then, and then moved to America and worked for Gibson and came up with all sorts of interesting um, and not terribly useful half the time electronic gadgetry to go into uh, 1970s guitars for Gibson. Um, but, I, but he was a very, very clever pickup designer. And I think, I th somebody was saying, I think he was the, 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 the person who, um, I think it was John Easton was saying, he was the person who influenced, the person who made most of my pickups in the early days, which was Kent Armstrong. Um, and and uh, Bill used to have this, this trick where he, he would borrow a credit card from somebody. He would get an audience around him and, and he'd get a, a jack socket with a, with a plugged into an amplifier but not into a guitar and then he'd borrow a credit card and he'd rub it on his shirt for a while until it built up some static and then put it onto the end of the, the, um, uh, the jack socket and put it behind some strings and pluck the strings and say I can even make a, a pick up out of it uh, and it was essentially a similar thing going on to the what's going on with the, the theatre but anyway to get back to your <laughs> sorry yeah <laughs> well I haven't tried it since um, but anyway um, maybe he knew stuff I didn't know, but uh, he was he was definitely larger than life character with Bill. Um, but yes, we have used them. They work very well in wooden bridges. I don't think they work terribly well in metal bridges. That's my personal thinking. Um, we have put them in, and we've we've had them made to go into saddles. We've bought um, um, you know ready-made bridges with here, so saddles, but they all sound a bit harsh to me. Um, you need to roll a lot of top end off with them. Um, where, where we have used them is burying them in the wood underneath the bridge. There it can, and, and generally when we do that, we use a secondary preamp because a piezo pickup is very high impedance. 
Um, so you definitely need to lower the, the signal before it sees anything else, um, because otherwise it will just sound all very thin and, and, and weedy. Um, and you definitely need to add a bit of gain to it. And um, we used to run two flexible, fle but we do occasionally run two flexible PSOs underneath a metal bridge, but in the wood. We also build guitars which rely entirely on, on, a, on a wooden bridge and have, have appeared so within that wooden bridge. I mean, there's quite a few makers do stuff like that. And you can make something that sounds more acoustic. I mean, it's now but it's never going to sound completely acoustic, but it will sound a lot more acoustic when it's plugged in. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's an interesting, another, another thing. They're, they're quite difficult to get right, actually. They have to be, to get them even, you, you have to, fiddle about with them a bit, <laughs> shall we say. I think Steve Swallow, who makes his Citroen? Yeah. He was like set, I think they've got like three or four. Yeah. We're trying to get the evenness, so they've got like three or four piezos under there. Yeah, right. yeah, well I mean, as I say, we always used to have two staggered ones yeah. that ran under the bridge kind of parallel to each other. Um, and that would give you a more even, and slightly fuller because it's picking up a bigger area of, I remember the, People have tried this in electric guitars for a long time. Um, I mean, the early um, uh, piezo pickups were made by people like Barkers Berry in the 70s. Um, and I think it was Frank Zappa who had them buried in his guitar neck. And, and he was like an early tapper, doing yeah, all that sort of yeah. stuff, you know, and picking up stuff with him. Um, there have been people that buried them into the ends of fingerboards, you know, for, for slapping. I mean, the 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 the, um, the up, you know, the up rockabilly people do it with with um, pickups, you know, on the end of the fingerboard to get that slap um, that um, you get with the, the, the rockabilly stars. I think. I mean, Jeffrey probably tells more about that. I don't. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, yes. Yeah. How long it takes to build one of those guitars from the very first day to the electronic? Yeah, guitar making. Let's get down to guitar making. Um, it, sorry? Six months. Six months he waited, yeah. Um, <laughs> Six months. Three weeks. <laughs> well, um, uh, I don't want to start that over. <laughs> um, in terms of actual time, from it, do, it does depend on the complexity of the build. If you're building something that's, um, you know, got relatively few bits in it, you know, like something like this, there's actually only two major pieces of wood there. So, you know, you can do most of the woodwork in a, in a couple of days. <coughs> um, there's then a whole load of final carving and smoothing and routing and fretting and all that sort well, of stuff. Well, how long does the sound bit take? Just the sound bit? Just the same. Well, well you've done something. Yeah, exactly, because I have to do it. Just, <laughs> it takes just forever. <laughs> well, dear old Pete the Fish, who, who was half of Wall Bases, used to say, you sand until you're sick of it, and then you sand a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the introduction to sanding. But no, I mean, it's, it's obviously it's about quality of what you try in terms of things like sanding. If you're going to put paint on it, then, you know, it needs to be smooth, but not scratch free. Um, if, you're, if you're sanding a hard wood, it's different to sanding a softer wood, you know. And again, one of the reasons why Leo used certain woods, all that is really, really easy to machine and really, really easy to sand, um, as is chivered wood and various other. Other things are really hard to sand, you know, and, and woods that have got soft, hard grain in them are a complete pain in the ass. Um, but um, it takes usually, it's, when we, we make bases, obviously, in, in batches, in factories, they make them in huge batches. Yeah. Um, I mean, I spent a few years ago, um, I spent some time in both China and Indonesia in really big factories. And um, where they're making batches of hundreds of instruments, you know. But it's pretty much the same as we, us making six. Yeah. You know, if we decide we're going to make six of those, we get enough wood out for six and we match it up with the wood we're going to make for the next. And then we <coughs> match the grain for the two halves of the body. And that process is the initial bit, if you see what I mean. It's going to the wood store, it's pulling the wood out, it's deciding which bits are going to go with which bits, both visually and also yeah. sonically. You get somebody who wants a really light bass and somebody who wants something that's got lots and lots of punch, so it's going to have to have something that's a bit heavier. 
um, and you choose the, the, the material. That's really the difference between what goes on in a factory and what goes on in a more custom. Yeah, because they will just take stuff off the shelf and it will just go into the thing. And it's not until the end you decide what the instrument is going to be like. Whereas we try and decide what the instrument is going to be like before we start. It's still not precise science, I have to say. But that's the first bit. So, you know, you say, well, there's a day of all that sort of stuff and get the, the material ready. And as I say, in our situation, it's unlikely you do one instrument at a time. You'd have a, a number of instruments at various stages overlapping each other, you know. And, um, you then do the sort of the, 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 the basic machinery and the basic gluing up, and then that process becomes finer. Now, I mean, obviously, as an instrument becomes more complicated, I mean, that over there has still only got a, a one piece neck with lots of reinforcement in it, but it's got a headstock that's been grafted on. Um, the neck is, the, the body is made from several pieces of wood rather than just two pieces of wood. So it gets more complicated. You get onto this one, where the neck goes into the body farther, so it, it, it goes all the way from the pickup. It gets, and it's got a bent, a top that's bent over the thing. It becomes more complicated again. You then get into the through neck instruments that have got more laminations. You know, that's got three pieces in the neck. Some of them have, might have five pieces in the neck, you know. And it is there for a reason. Some of it is about, I can have more than you can have sort of thing, but um, <laughs> most of it is, is, is there for a reason, and it's about stiffness. A neck, sorry, I'm digressing a bit from your question, but just to get into, into necks, the stiffer a neck is, the more, again, clarity you will get, and that becomes more important the lower you go. So um, one of the, the things that we started doing when we started making five string bases, I've mentioned 36 inch scale. By extending the scale length, you can, you, the string is tighter. So a lower tuned string will be tighter, so therefore the, it will ring better. Short scale, that string is not at a, at a, at such a, um, a high tension, so therefore, but it's at the same pitch, but it will be floppier so you won't get as much definition from it. So you then need to find out where the energy, you can save energy, because so basically it's all about energy moving up and down that string, and how the energy is absorbed into the, uh, the sound, into the, the, the materials that the instrument's made, and of it, that gives you the tone of the instrument, that's what I was talking about in the other seminar. Um, but if you if are losing energy from the string, um, and you, um, uh, trying to, you know, at, 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 at the out, outer edges of what's possible, if you see what I mean. So you get down to sort of, you know, a, a B string, which is, is 30 hertz, that is fundamental, which is below the level where most backline amplifiers are rolled off, most backline amplifiers and speakers are rolled off, sort of 40 something hertz. You know, so what you're hearing is the harmonic content of the note. And, uh, you know, the a, a 30 hertz. Fundamentally, it's pretty. It's like a fog, you know. It's it's it's, it's very low, um, and you need that whole spread of, of, of harmonics in there in order to, to be able to hear it. And if you're losing those in a neck that is absorbing a lot of a lot of frequency, then you will have a very dull sounding B string. But if you can maintain the stiffness of that neck, then you will get. You, um, you'll get more clarity out of a less taut string, if that makes sense. Which is why people, I mean, we, we use a, a, either steel, we use ju dual wires either side of the trust rod, um, steel, <coughs> or we use carbon, carbon, graphite, carbon fibre. Carbon fibre is lighter, um, and in bigger sections, it's stiffer. Um, steel is very, it still works very well, you know, but it obviously adds a little weight to the, to the, to the neck. Um, I mean, that's partly what the, 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 the single cut thing's about. You know, all this thing with people having the, 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 the Anthony Jackson thing of joining the, the neck right up here, you know, the 12th fret, is that there's less neck to move, yeah. to resonate. That's what that, what's about, because he was, you know, the contrabass, I mean, he pretty much invented it. So... Just a quick question. So yeah. when you're building up guitar for a specific client, like, for example, your bass, yeah. when you come into the workshop just to test guitar, let's say, you know, when the guitar was nearly done, a lot of luthiers will work like that um, because we actually only meet about 5% of our customers 
I mean, we, we export more than we sell in the UK, and we deal directly with individuals. I mean, we don't generally sell through each other's shops. So it's about listening. I mean, I'm talking a lot here, but I, it's about listening and understanding and learning from the experience. So Phil will come to me and say, I want a base that's, I want to do a slap course for Scott's base lessons in three weeks' time. And I need the I need the <laughs> Do you know, know the story about this? Do you know because we said about the three week, six month thing? Who was it? Who had that? Just to let you know how much of a legend Chris is, is that we did this the slap course of SBL. And I went to have a four string jazz because you can hear you. Like, it can't it don't work, does it? Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Power. No, it's my master. <laughs> Today. <laughs> um, just to give you an idea on the production thing, because we talk about, you know, um, personability, that's a nice word. Yep. Um, but the thing about, should I stand or sit? No. I'm indecisive with being filmed, so I need to work it out quickly. Um, but the, the, yeah, with that slap box, I mean, you guys all, have, who's SBL members here? Hands up. Yeah. 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 Stephen. Um, with, uh, we just did the slap base course. When did that come out? Tuesday? Yeah, it's all good. And I wanted, to, I specifically asked Chris, I got in contact with Chris because, um, as you guys may know, I use uh, extended range instruments and five strings, all sorts of stuff. And I didn't want you guys to get flooded with seeing me playing a five string bass or six strings. Like so I asked for a very simple four string jazz, which is actually that jazz there, the first one on the left hand side, the off preamp that Chris spoke about earlier on. Um, yeah, we, we have very minimal contact. But to give you an idea how legendary Chris is, is I had to leave for a gig at five o'clock in the evening before then get the train to SBL HQ. And the courier made my house by about two minutes. He literally put my sign for the base at 4.58. And then got me, oh thanks. And by the time I did the slap base course, which you guys have seen, I think the lacquer was still, I think it was leech. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, it, got, it got very close. Um, with, the, with the contact, um, yeah, it's very important if, if uh, every base is individual to some degree. Obviously, when you contact a manufacturer, there's going to be things that attract you to that manufacturer in the first place. Um, I made a big list of all things that I wanted to do. And actually, if you go onto Overwater's website currently, the YouTube pages and stuff like that, there's some nice little video documentaries where we talk about what made me be attracted to the company. Yeah, yeah, there's, nothing... there's more of that coming out. We've, we've, we've been cutting it up to little snippets. So... It's, it had nothing to do with the name. That's really important. Sorry, Chris. Um, but it didn't. Um, I have wrote down a piece of paper on what I wanted from the base. And this is great because when you talk to people at the moment, uh, I mean, Steve's just bought a, a, a base that you guys need to go and check out. Okay, very really beautiful instrument. But it's about feedback from the player to the manufacturer. Um, I made a list and I said, I want a base which uh, I make a lot of mistakes. Actually, some of the things I discovered the hard way, which was things like EMG pickups, sorry, uh, and all that sort of stuff that didn't really appeal to me as a player. I wrote down on a piece of paper all the things that I wanted. So I said I wanted it to be 35 inch neck, I wanted it to be three body, you know, three neck thing, but maybe three body streaming, three man EQ that I could control. Um, shield and I do a lot of work with features. Um, where actually I'm not using amplifiers, it's all my ears. Um, so the sound that gets put out front is 100% from the bass, so I need the signal to be as clean as possible and have the maximum tonal control on board. And I said, who makes this bass? That's why I don't have that because they tick to the boxes and that's it. So some of the time when you do get in contact with the company, actually you'll find that they're already offering what you're looking for, and that's where the relationship starts. It's 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 it's, it's a learning process. I mean I've I've, I've been doing I, mean, I was I was talking to somebody last night. The first show I did in Olympia was 38 years ago. <laughs> 1979. And, and and I think that's when I met Bill Lawrence. And, um, and um, I'm being waved, but it's nearly the end. Um, but it's by working with players, I mean, my, my um, uh, great privilege, if you like, is the fact that I've worked with lots of great players for lots and lots of years. You know, I mean, um, there was an old friend of ours, an old friend of, of, of Phil's, or a newer friend of Phil's, an old friend of mine, Mo Foster was here um, yesterday, and Mo is an absolute legend. That I made a five string for Mo thirty years ago. You know, one of the first five string that he had, 
And um, I worked with uh, 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 pit players and, and, and studio players and people that were on things that you get to hear but you don't necessarily know who they are. And being part of that world, you learn stuff. And it just kind of filters through and you start to get a little bit more dogmatic about stuff. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, in my old age, I'm getting more, I'm kind of more like that. But it's because... He's you, actually mellowed in his old age. <laughs> I don't smoke chisels true, anymore. <laughs> yes, okay. But anyway, um, you know, the process of making a guitar out. from scratch is usually, it, the, the thing that slows it down is the lacquering process because once you put lacquer onto it, it has to sit for a while in order to, um, as, as Phil said about it still being soft, it, it does need a certain amount, of, and if it's a high gloss finish, then it needs longer. But, so, it could sit for three weeks in a cupboard, you know, just with, with heat resting, of it, yeah. resting, yeah. But the actual manufacturing usually takes about a month from when we start putting wood out to the point where it goes, you know, um, to, to be assembled or uh, sprayed or whatever, you know, um, and the assembly process. I mean, that's the bit, another big difference between, and the thing that I learned with my association with, with, with Tanglewood, I, I've worked with a licensing thing with Tanglewood, who are a big manufacturer of guitars. And they make 100,000 guitars a year, we make 100 guitars a year. So it's, it's a, quite an interesting mix. And um, they don't do anything in small scale, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, um, and the thing that I discovered in big manufacturer, everything is, is, is measured from the front back. So they decide on what the price point's going to be. And that determines what they're going to have to make it for. And I mean, the entry level base that we made in, in, in uh, China um, retailed for three, no, two ninety nine. It was a nice little instrument, very simple. Um, it cost. It, we had to make it for eighty five dollars. And that doesn't give you a lot of. T you can you can do all the manufacturing really really efficiently. You know, you can great machines. You know, really efficient process, pre prepared materials, all that stuff. But what you can't do is set it up quickly. And that's where that stuff falls down. And, and that is something I would urge with everybody. When you buy an instrument, it doesn't matter how much you pay for it, it's always worth spending a few quid on going to somebody who really knows what they're doing, who can set that instrument up. You know, because you can, you know, you can go and earn a living on 120 quid PD, whatever, you know. But unless it's set up properly, you know, it doesn't matter. Even if it's like a fifteen hundred quid Fender, yeah, oh like yes, absolutely. There, their priority is to get it out into the shop without any buzzes on the fingerboard or the fretboard, and they haven't got like two hours in the wood. You know, if you buy a like a factory instrument, they haven't got two or three hours to do the setup. So they crank the action up high, send it out, and you know, as bass players, we go to bass shops and we assume that that's where the action should be. Oh yeah, because it's just come from Fender and that's where the action should be. It's actually not, you know, it's not it's yeah. not true. They're only cranking that action high so they don't have to spend the time to set the instrument up. Yeah, and anyway, yeah. And it, it, becomes more, it becomes more vulnerable the lower the, 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 the strings are, the closer the strings are, the finer the setup, the, the, the less it has to move yeah. to not be right. You know, yeah. so it, it also demands a certain amount of understanding and I think that most bass players should, I mean it's not the right environment to do it here and I have tried to do it in this sort of environment, but most bass players, guitar players, should know the basics of, of, of setting up. We've done some videos. Yeah, so if you're like an SPL <laughs> member, you'd be able to go to the course yeah. library and check right. out the, you know, the yeah. bass yeah. maintenance and, and, um, Yes, and, and um, you know, knowing how to adjust the truss rod, knowing how to adjust the intonation, the string height, and that sort of thing, understanding how that works is, is a very important thing because otherwise you're like a, somebody riding a bike who can't fix the puncher which is a bad place to be chris where can everybody find you if they want to find you on, online what's your yeah, website um, our website is openwaterbasis.com um, we have a facebook page which if you just put in overwater basis it will come up um there's, there's some lifts down there and there's some cards in my top pocket um and yeah. And just if you want to come to the front while Steve's setting up his gear, you could play on some of Chris's bases and have a bit of a tinkle about. And and, and if you want a book, <laughs> <laughs> Phil's got some books. But, but also, if you want to get it, can you tell us some of the time where Steve's setting up? Oh, please come out and chat to me. We can talk about some of the relationships I've got with Chris and stuff like that. More yeah. than happy to. I mean, that's
that's something actually, the relationship thing of it. I mean, I have had long-term relationships with quite a lot of the bass players. That sounds kind of kinky, that doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but it's surprising. I'm not going to let that information. <laughs> But yeah, it's that, that's, it, you know, this, this thing where you gradually, I mean, like with Phil, you know, we, we've worked on instruments as his requirements have changed. The instruments have changed, same thing with Scott. Yeah, like, it, you know, what you like now, you might not, you know, want in a year or anything like that. Yeah. You know, I'm the same as everybody else, I like, you know, I was watching a YouTube video the other day. I was, I was looking at Rich Brown, we'd just been out in New York doing a course with Rich Brown. And he's playing, what's that basic place? Ken Lawrence, so I was talking to him. Hey, it sounds amazing, so what am I doing? I'm geeking out on Ken Lawrence bases, and you know, my wife's hawking me. She's like, you can't spend any more money on a bass. Anyway, without me blurbing up, Steve needs to set up his gear. Big hand to Chris. <laughs> you can find him online.